First of all, I would like I would, I would say good morning to everyone and thank you for joining uh, this webinar. It's a kind of unusual situation for me uh, to talk to the monitor, but I hope I will do my best to present as good as I can. Uh, but I know that on the other side there are many people uh, listening to me. I would like to thank AIVC and INIVA for giving me this opportunity. Well, this presentation is the, uh, the, uh, the plenary talk that I was asked to receive at the, uh, the conference that uh, took place last year uh, in September in Washington, D.C., actually in Alexandria, uh, and was organized by ASHRA. And I was, at that time, the, uh, the president of the conference, Professor Bill Banflett, uh, who is the past president of uh, ASHRA as well, he invited me to give a talk. Um, and also AIBC asked me to, to join the conference and give the plenary uh, talk on their behalf. And we discussed what should be the topic of my presentation. And I, we discussed that perhaps the best one would be to start the discussion on the indices that have been used uh, on indoor air quality and how we approach the problem for the future. So they, because the, the entire conference was actually to set the stage for the entire conference, which has been uh, which was discussing actually the uh, the indices. So for those who joined Alexandria, I'm not sure that I will be able to deliver a very exact the same uh, talk, but I will probably the points, uh, or not probably, are the points that the main important elements of that are here in this presentation as well. So as Maria said. For those who are expecting that I will give you the answer how, what should be the future uh, index of air quality, uh, I'm, I don't have this answer. I may have my opinion on what, how, it's this, uh, how this index should look like, but I really, this is not the purpose of this, con uh, of this talk. The purpose of this talk is to look back and see what indices uh, were used, what other advantages or strengths and weaknesses, and uh, whether any of that can be in the future uh, uh, used as an index. And then um, also uh, discuss how uh, in the future we should set the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, create the index of indoor air quality, and whether there is any uh, research that is needed to uh, basically support the creation of such an index. And these are, of course, my opinions, and uh, I would be very happy to then address any questions that may arise. And of course, there will be the discussion will be going on because this topic has gained the momentum in the last month, and I will and I believe that it will get a momentum this year and the years to follow. But this is not a very new topic because uh, that that has been discussed. Uh, at the, nearly at the beginning of my career in the late 90s uh, and in the early tw uh, 2000, the 2000, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, indoor air quality indexes, but then those discussions uh, have dissolved somehow, and then we are coming back to this. Before we go into the, uh, t the topic, I believe this is a good idea to review what we understand by indoor air quality and also by some of the outcomes or uh, modalities that we are going to address. So I believe there are several dis definitions of the uh, indoor air quality. The one that is uh, proposed by the Environmental Protection Agency and is the same is, as in Wikipedia is that indoor air quality refers to the air quality within and around buildings and structures especially as it relates to the health and comfort of building occupants. I believe that this is a very, very nice definition of that because it actually gets to the point on how we should create such an index. If we talk about indoor air quality index, we should be thinking about the air quality within the building and within the building and outside the building. It, and this is captured in that, uh, uh, in that definition. Also, this definition is captured the purpose of the index, which is capturing this the purpose of the index, which is talking about the health and comfort of building uh, occupants. So it's actually giving a direction. It's we, not only that we are going to talk about the some sort of a measure of our quality, but measure that is important for the users of the buildings or the building occupants. 
There are other uh, definitions as well. One that is probably here interesting uh, that we can go in uh, and look at it is the last last bullet point that was is proposed by ASHRA and is in the ASHRA standard 60 tool of ventilation standard, which is the uh, air quality is the air in uh, the air uh, in which there are no known or uh, the higher quality is the air in which there are no known contaminants at harmful concentration, and that majority of people exposed do not express dissatisfaction. So this is a, a different uh, way of looking at this. And of course, another this definition that is important to start the discussion is to discuss how do we understand health. And all of us, at a certain, probably at a certain point of, in our career, defined health as it is defined by WHO. It's uh, basically not only the absence of disease, but basically it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. However, it's a very, very broad uh, definition. It does not define the direction. And actually, it's only broadly, holistically approach the issue of health. I would really, I would be, uh, I would really like to point your direction into the, the third bullet point here, which is uh, basically the definition of American th thorac thoracic society, which uh, define an adverse health by defining the endpoints. So the biomarker response or decreased uh, quality of life or permanent detectable adverse physiological impact and so on. Here, the uh, health outcome is very well defined and actually also in points out into the direction of probably development of the, uh, the index. So having that in, uh, in mind, let's have a look at the indices that have been used in the past. So I, the, we have only half an hour, or a little bit more than a half an hour for my talk, so I'm not able to uh, go in, um, deeply into the, each of the in, indices that have been used, but I, I put up the list of five, to me, the most important ones here, and I will look through them uh, in, um, in a moment, and I will uh, uh, extend them also a little bit later, discussing some other um, indices that were proposed. So I, I will start with ventilation rate and then go through carbon dioxide, TVOC, and then uh, hu human response. Uh, except as an, define as an acceptability of air quality or percentage of dissatisfied or occupant complaints. So let's start with the ventilation rate. Um, it can be debated whether the ventilation rate is actually an, uh, an index of air quality. And I agree with many of you, perhaps, that uh, share the same point that it is not an index of air quality. But in the absence of uh, index of air quality, actually ventilation has been used as if it had been the uh, index of air quality. Also because uh, we were not able to define the exposure, actually, or the pollutants of concern, uh, and uh, uh, there is a common belief and opinion that ventilation is related to some of the outcomes uh, uh, and uh, uh, modalities. Uh, here the example is for the uh, uh, prevalence of acute health uh, symptoms, uh, subclinical symptoms, uh, better known as SBS as, as, as uh, symptoms, but um, mm, there is also the relation between the ventilation and the perception of air quality and the performance. So, from that point of view, ventilation has been used as a sort of a, a metric of air quality. I mean, the, there is a belief that a higher ventilation is a better air quality and so on. So, these are the beliefs of, of a, I call it also a misconceptions related with ventilation. Because as such, ventilation, uh, and I will come back to this, is probably not a very good index of air quality, although it can be used uh, uh, to define uh, air quality. So the, the, the beliefs are that more ventilation always improves indoor air quality, and uh, I believe that many of us, and many of my students also share this opinion, but it's not always the case. Uh, I'll give you uh, the case in which the Let's say we go to the Central Europe now, which suffers from smog. So more ventilation will not improve indoor air quality, but actually aggravate because we'll bring the pollutants from outdoors. 
Lack of ventilation or low ventilation rate means poor air quality. I believe that this is also a, a common belief that if we have no ventilation, we, we have to have ventilation because otherwise the air quality is poor. But what if we have low emitting materials? I mean, if the exposures are low, do we really need to have high ventilation rate. So this is sort of a, a, a misconception here. Then there, there is belief that if we use ventilation, we'll remove effectively all pollutants in spite of their type. And this is not true as well, because we know that for some groups of organic pollutants, such as semi-volatile organic pollutants, and some particles, such as uh, ultrafine particles, Ventilation is not an effective method of reducing their levels. Then everyone believed that they can measure ventilation. So suddenly, if we make it properly, it is easy to measure ventilation. But the question arises, what type of ventilation is important here in the context of air quality? Is it an instantaneous measurement? Is it a long-term measurement? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, are the changes of ventilation and so on? So this is easy to measure, uh, certainly, but I mean, interpretation is not that uh, simple. And then, uh, of, of course, uh, ventilation can be used to predict human responses. So it is a performance-based metric. To be honest, I come, I come back to this, it's probably not always the case because of those problems related with ventilation. And one, one example of how ventilation you know, even in the standard is uh, shown that ventilation is probably not the right index here, is uh, the example here where you see this is from the European standard, the N15251, that defines three levels of the pollution loads in buildings. And for the three levels of pollution, uh, 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 the pollution loads, and if we take ventilation rate of 10, let's say here, you'll see the percentage of dissatisfied with the air quality uh, uh, in the space will be different. So for the same ventilation rate, we will have two different levels of the air quality. So uh, it cannot be uniformly used because there is another dimension that needs to be tackled here. The reason for that is that ventilation is merely uh, 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 an intermediate index. Uh, it's actually not the causative factor. Uh, uh, and the, the problem uh, is that ventilation is considered as a causative factor for the, some of the modalities or uh, uh, outcomes, human outcomes. But this is not, uh, ventilation is modifying exposures, that, and exposures through the human uptake, you know, and we really, I mean, that can be another discussion on the, how the human uptake takes place, is affecting uh, health and comfort. So ventilation is modifying exposure, it can improve the exposure, when the uh, pollutants, when it will dilute the pollutants, but it can also bring the pollutants from uh, and increase the exposures actually by bringing the pollutants. So, so this is the first, and uh, as we see from the history, ventilation, there has been a lot of debate on what should be the level of ventilation. So, even looking at this historical evidence, we can see that basically that there is no uh, consensus on how much ventilation that should be uh, needed. And uh, even looking at uh, the uh, health periods here at, to, at the beginning and towards the end, you can see that there is um, much higher ventilation than for the, uh, I call it comfort period, when the, uh, the different modalities or different outcomes are used to define the ventilation requirement. So although simple, relatively easy to verify and readily available, as is used today, and although it shows association with air quality and human outcomes, I don't think the ventilation may be considered as a solid and credible metric for predicting air quality between buildings. So if we have one building or one space in a building and we just modify ventilation, certainly we can do, but we cannot use the same approach for different buildings, different even rooms within a, within a building. So then to the group of ventilation, I will basically also be, um, uh, one other uh, metric that it also is a part of that is the carbon dioxide. It's the most ubiquitously used and most often frequent used metric today, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide uh, is used. Why is used? Because it is a measure of ventilation efficiency 
uh, in the presence of uh, uh, humans in space. If there are no humans in space, the carbon, there's basically no carbon dioxide, so it, it's difficult to measure uh, it. Also, many regulations and uh, building codes are now beginning to actually regulate, rather than provide the ventilation requirements, they actually provide the uh, requirements for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has also been shown recently to be a uh, um, um, hazardous pollutant uh, uh, affecting performance, but there is a still debate whether this data uh, can, uh, is uh, and requires actually further ver verification because there is some conflicting evidence that was published. Nevertheless, CO2 is measured. There are several groups of maybe I would say all of the groups nearly that use carbon dioxide. And here we see the relation uh, between the measured carbon dioxide concentration and percentage dissatisfied with their quality. And of course we know that carbon dioxide here is basically a metric of the uh, ventilation efficiency or the emissions from, human, uh, from humans. So if we look, go back, the origin of CO2 is from the work of Pettenkofer in the 19th, in the 19th century who published a book, Über der Luftwechsel in von Gebäuden, where he actually defined the level of carbon dioxide. But when we talk about carbon dioxide, we forget that he created a certain limiting criteria when we can use carbon dioxide. So he said that we, carbon dioxide can be used because this is a, it is representing the emanation of, of the em emissions from humans, but all the other emissions should be not allowed in spaces if we use this as a metric. So for other emissions, they should be basically removed from the spaces. This is what he proposed. And this is, these are the original results of Pettenkofer. You see the, the lines, red uh, dot, uh, dashed line and blue dashed line. Uh, he actually made the measurements in several spaces and then uh, asked the occupants to measure, to assess the air quality there. And then based on their assessments uh, or annoyance basically that is uh, generated, he defined 1000 ppm as a maximum allowable level. 700 was defined for uh, bedrooms. But this is the evidence based on which we use today a 1000 ppm. So the outcome is actually the annoyance. We really don't know whether it's a comfort or it's a health outcome, but uh, it's actually, this is how the results are based. And this is the basis for today's 1000 ppm that was used by him. The similar approach was proposed by, uh, uh, the, uh, if we talk about human bioeffluence, I think we, it is nice to recall the, the concept that has, was proposed by Fanga in the um, late 80s. Uh, of the previous century when he proposed that uh, any type of pollution source can be expressed as human bioeffluence. Uh, I mean, in the strengths of the human bioeffluence. And by this, he defined two units, Ulf and Decibel, and Ulf is actually the standard uh, person that is actually a, a metric that can be used to quantify the strengths of different sources of pollutants. And the Decibel was a unit of the uh, uh, effect. And then um, he, uh, uh, um, so the concept, the idea was brilliant in a sense that uh, basically um, the nature of the uh, ventilation is to basically provide ventilation for humans. So if we express everything with the human strength or the emissions from humans, then it will be easy to define the ventilation requirements. However, there have been some problems related with the um, um, proposed concept, and I have basically no time now to go through this. But the whole idea of expressing some sources and uh, um, with some equivalent other sources uh, uh, has been uh, is actually very good, and has been actually used uh, when defining other uh, metric matrices. I will come back to this. So, although CO2 is used ubiquitously, we have to realize that it is not a very good indicator of other sources of pollutants other than humans. So, these are the recently published study by the group uh, in France. 
by Ramallah et al., who showed that actually there is only a weak relation between the levels of carbon dioxide in a space and formaldehyde. So here an acrolein uh, on the right hand. But generally, we have to realize that CO2 is not efficient as the, uh, uh, an indicator of their quality if there is no source of CO2 in space. So for the uh, uh, intermediate conclusion for the CO2, I mean, uh, we really don't know that there are several problems related to the measurements of CO2. And then, uh, because it's highly variable uh, and uh, there are time effects, and uh, often in the measurements, steady state is assumed, and, but it's nearly never reached. Uh, sometimes the peak is used. So I, it's very, interpretation of the measurement is uh, uh, very different. So it's difficult to compare between the different studies. Then, if using CO2, we need to assume uh, generation rates of carbon dioxide. Uh, by humans. So depending on a metabolic rate, it will be different. So those assumptions are often crude and uh, they are affected by many factors. Uh, recently, there was a paper last year from the group in Beijing, from Tsinghua University, that showed that even a thermal discomfort or thermal uh, uh, effects can affect the um, uh, emission rates or metabolic rates. So this is another issue of this. So. Is, it is a good marker of ventilation, that, that, that con but contains all pros and cons of ventilation. So then TVOC. This is an old concept. I believe that uh, some uh, that is coming back, in a sense. Uh, um, it was introduced, uh, uh, again, also in the 80s and 90s of the uh, last century. And basically, it's the uh, adding the masses of uh, polluting molecules. And it was defined as the... Uh, compounds that contain uh, six between six and sixteen atoms of carbon, and uh, these are the volatile organic compounds. So some of them, or integration of them, was used uh, proposed as an index. So similar to the kind of an old concept where you try to express uh, pollutants by some uh, one metric, but actually this <coughs> this index is not very good in defining the very, very, uh, very volatile organic compounds, and you can see here on the left hand, on the right hand with uh, the compounds with a high boiling point, semi-volatile organic compounds. And we know that especially semi-volatile organic compounds are, may, may have a very important implications for, our, uh, for human health. So, uh, uh, and for this also, the ventilation rate is not an effective method of removal of them. But this, so this comp concept did not capture that. Two, so uh, uh, those response relationships were proposed for <coughs> defining the levels of acceptable levels of TVOC. One based on the left hand that you see, it was based on the experimental work on the right, based on the measuring data. More or less the same level for no irritation or discomfort. The left hand is defining only the levels for TVOC. The right hand is actually interesting approach which defines the acceptable levels for the groups, and but either of them has uh, its own uh, pros and cons. The right one is based on the empirical measuring data, not toxicological evaluations, and we really don't know whether it will be applicable in the modern buildings, today's buildings. So even although I talk about it, then the, the concept was introduced in the 90s, but then in the, towards the end of the 90s, the group of researchers reviewed the literature and epidemiological literature and found that TBOC is not a risk factor for health and comfort in non-industrial environment. So if we want to use it as an, I mean, we can use it as a measure of the level of exposure, but whether we, if we want to use it as a risk factor for health and comfort, it is not a, uh, a proper concept. At least from the epidemiological data, that was available at that time when this conclusion was uh, uh, proposed. So there were other attempts to define uh, metrics that tried to um, uh, merge the different uh, pollutant measurements. And probably here we have a, a number of bullet points, and, uh, and they are slightly grouped. So the first one is uh, uh, probably the most, uh, I would a interesting approach. This was proposed by the group in California and Tanbrinka, who actually tried to 
uh, def uh, um, uh, identify the compounds that may be responsible for effects on humans and then try to develop the metric based only on the pollutants that may uh, have an effect on humans, rather than taking all of them, because maybe not all of them are important. And for those who are interested in the concept of VOC and further develop this, I would suggest that you read this paper. It's a very interesting approach. Uh, and then the three other dots in the middle, these are the based, uh, these are the approaches that actually try to draw from the, uh, um, try to draw from the uh, experiences in defining the index for the ambient air pollutant, ambient air pollut pollution index. And uh, they uh, basically uh, take the measurements and create arbitrary uh, levels, and based on those levels affect the, uh, 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 define the air quality levels. And the last one recently published, which is also an interesting approach, which is defining the index based on the sources rather than on all the pollutants, but on the sources of pollution. So uh, very, very quickly, uh, there is an annex uh, uh, of the uh, 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 of International Energy Agency, Annex 68, that uh, is actually produced the uh, uh, report that will be a tech note of the AIBC published later today, probably maybe before the Brussels conference in March, which in which we try to um, uh, review the available the uh, indices that are uh, have been created for the air quality and propose a, a certain approach how this air quality index can be used for the purpose of the project, but also that can create a, a, a discussion on how to advance in the future. And uh, so I, I just only briefly show this here, so for those who are interested, uh, so go on AIBC, because then there will be a soon a report uh, that will be published uh, for that. Uh, often air quality index uh, has also been defined uh, in relation to the uh, odor or irritation threshold limits. So we have a data uh, for the occupational environment, also the occupational exposure limits, and based on this, uh, there were attempts to compare concentrations of pollutants measured against the levels for the, uh, that for the occupational exposure levels or for the threshold limits. There are problems related with that uh, as well. One of the problems that is uh, uh, an important problem is that uh, uh, so that is one, the measurement of the concentration, and the other one is the uh, the threshold limits that, or the thresholds that are set, or the exposure limit levels, that can be different, can differ, and may not reflect the actual exposure limits that are uh, occurring indoors. So although it seems to be somewhat uh, important for screening, but I don't think that it has a chance to. Um, it has an, uh, uh, it can develop in a, in a certain you know metric in the future. So the finally assessment by humans. So um, we can all also use the humans as the an assessments by humans to define the metric and has been uh, or the define the air quality level. And then this can be probably maybe have been there was an attempt to convert this into the. Um, metric of our quality. And actually, standards are referring to the assessments of humans. I showed you the definition of our quality set by uh, ASHA standard. Also, in the European standard, the levels of the uh, indoor environmental quality are set by the uh, dissatisfaction that is caused. So, uh, <clears throat> but those, they also have some problems. As with the phys physical and chemical measurements, there are problems also related with the measurements of the uh, using the human. And these are only the few bullet points that uh, indicate that. Uh, because of the time, I will not have very much time to go through all of them, but you know, the, how, we, how we measure, what measuring scale, what endpoints we are looking at, the effects of temperature, length of exposure, and sensitivity of subjects. So all those have to be considered if we, when we use uh, uh, humans as the uh, measuring instrument. I just give you two examples. One is an effect of temperature and relative humidity on perceived air quality, on the percentage of dissatisfied with the air quality. You see here that the percentage of uh, the same level of exposure, the changing of temperature, will affect the perception of air quality. So, um, so this is a, an important uh, uh, um, intervening factor, or I would say disturbing factor. 
Another one is a sensory fatigue. Whether we are talking about the people who are coming into the space or are, or are somewhat adapted to the conditions in the space, it will also affect the percentage of dissatisfied with the air quality. Well, and finally, as the uh, precision of the measurements. And if we only use the uh, dichotomous scale of acceptable, not acceptable, you know, we would have to have a panelist of 6,000 people to have a relative standard error of 1%. So the precision of this, I mean, the 20% is precision that is uh, that for this type of scale is 20 panelists. 10% uh, is 65 panelists. So, so then precision is also important. And even if we do this, we will have to somewhat, uh, we are not able to, you know, send panels to different buildings. So we would have to somehow create uh, an electronic nose that can be taught, or some sort of an array of sensors that uh, uh, can be taught against the measurements that are taken by the, uh, are made by the human subjects. And then this is one of the uh, first attempts to create such a, and I would uh, invite everyone who is interested in this. There have been many other attempts, not very successful after that. I will skip this other points uh, for the satisfaction because basically they address uh, the same issue and come back to the, uh, go back and see into the future. But first I would like to summarize the limitations of previous attempts. So they address mainly exposures to chemical compounds and have you not, I haven't talked about microbiological pollution or the infectious uh, agents and so on. So, on. so address usually one modality. Is it a health or comfort? Uh, but we don't know whether, you know, addressing one modality will protect against another modality and so on. The reliability and repeatability can be arguable. And then they are most related to ventilation compliance. If you notice, it's all of it is actually related to ventilation. There are major challenges if we want to develop the metric in the future. And, uh, it, and some of them I, I actually pointed out here. It's, uh, first of all, it's incomplete data on exposures to low levels of pollutants. And we really don't know about the acute and chronic effects. And we have very little information about the chronic effects of pollutants. We have most of it is an acute. Interactions of pollutants is another. We don't have reference values for many pollutants. Uh, measurement challenges, some repeatability, comparability, and accuracy. So variance of, I mean, the variation in time of the exposures and concentration. And then huge variation in human susceptibility and sensitivity. So we are different. So, so and uh, IAQ, if we even use a comfort as a mo modality or, or endpoint that we want to use, is not a main attribute uh, uh, of human comfort, I mean, IAQ. So taking into account those, you may say, okay, is this really, there is a, a chance. Can it be developed? Is there any hope? Well, I believe there is a hope. We need to basically agree, all of us, that what we need is now is that, that we have some information on some pollutants. And one example is the uh, guidelines that are produced by WHO. We know for those pollutants for sure that they create health hazards. So if we start to regulate them, we will make a step forward. Although we know that there will be new pollutants coming on the market all the time, but at least we will, we will be able to, to deal with those pollutants that we know that, uh, that are hazardous for our health. So the question is, is, necess is it necessary? So if we know that there are problems, should we really invest time? I would refer to the quote that was made in the paper that I, w I had the privilege to co-author by Ernst Steinemann, uh, published uh, last year in the Building and Environment, which says basically the lack of IAQ metric or disagreement what should constitute IAQ metric is a significant barrier holding back innovation of IAQ, conducive technologies, emergence of undocumented methods, uh, and then it will create. Uh, so basically what this quote is saying is that because we don't have a metric, A, we are not going to able, uh, we are not developing uh, 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 innov uh, in innovative technologies for, set for controlling IAQ. Also, other undocumented methodology can be basically be developed and used as a metric in the future. And I believe this is not what we want to do. So how to advance? In order to advance with a metric, we need to think about what is, 
the purpose of the uh, 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 this is the most important and what are the basic conditions that need to be fulfilled to develop the metric so the premise is unarguable I mean of course what we want to do is we have to address the basic human requirements I think it believes what is the most important is that we don't want to just measure we just want to measure something that is important for us for humans and that we is, is actually shown to be uh, uh, to having to have an effect on humans so it, so the premise is the human centricity of the IQ index I think it's very important and then we of course certainly should have as a big spectrum of pollutants as possible and uh, uh, we have to decide whether single or, uh, criteria or multiple criteria need, uh, indices need to be used. And then we come to the purpose. And then we can have different purposes of developing, and when there could be different indices for different purposes. So one can be the question would be which endpoint should be addressed. Then whether it should be a voluntary or mandatory metric. For which purpose it should be used? Should it be used for design, for operation of buildings? Uh, uh, should it be um, only an indicator of unusual conditions or on average conditions? Should it be the marker of condition uh, of the assets or footprints or label? Um, so that that actually defines the IQ in the uh, index in the future. We, that that this answer have to be answered before even we start to measure something, and then. Three important points to just finish up is the uh, basic requirements, uh, how we approach this. So uh, what are the basic requirements for IQ? Can we adapt already existing indices and how, how we uh, uh, use the precautionary principle? I believe that in order to succeed in developing the IQ metric, we need to reduce sources and eliminate sources of pollutants. Because sources are ubiquitous, are dominate, are diverse. People pro, uh, purchase, you know, we cannot control what people buy and what people put in their buildings. So there must be minimum standardization on this exposure uh, elements. Because if we don't do this, we can actually develop the most wonderful metric, but we won't be able to capture everything that is coming into the buildings. We'll not be able to to do this. So this applies for both commercial and residential sector. And for those who are interested, there is a, uh, an attempt in Europe, uh, which is LCI concept, lowest concentration of interest for the labeling of building materials. There is a set of 200 pollutants that set basically minimum requirements for the emissions of building. And this is the right approach towards the standardization of the exposure levels. It's the same as we do for water, for food, that can be done also for the air. But we have to be consistent. We have to follow those requirements. Then, should we develop a new metric or should we use a metric that exists? I believe that a good approach would be to use the metrics that have been, um, how to say, um, accepted by other groups. It's difficult to come forward with a new metric so, um, and convince other groups that this is the right metric. So maybe an approach using qualis or dalis that are used already by the um, in the medical uh, groups. Maybe this is the, the, the right approach for the future that should be looked at. And there is a tech note 68 also produced by AIBC in which actually an approach of you know using uh, quali uh, uh, using dali actually to define the pollutants of concern has been used and a few pollutants of concern using the DALI approach has been, have been defined. The similar approach is also pro, uh, proposed by the Annex 68 that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. So just to complete my talk, uh, leaving you two minutes for the questions, I believe that we give a little bit more to the audience. Uh, what are the three primary research initiatives for the future? So I believe there are three ways of how we can approach, and uh, the research should focus on those. Is one is uh, using a traditional approach and basically um, integrating big data, measuring, mapping pollutants and responses of humans, and basically trying to find based on the statistical methods, mathematical methods, and using epidemiological approach, uh, some sort of a patterns that can define 
the metric for the future. This is one way of doing, and uh, it is feasible and um, possible and plausible. The other way would be to look at the <coughs> health performance indicators. <coughs> Actually, go back maybe to the laboratory or maybe talk with the medical sciences and then try to look at the certain biomarkers or other human physiological responses and use those as a metric. That maybe uh, is actually going into the uh, uh, it's an interesting approach because it allows also individualization of the environment or individualization of the conditions for each people because we may have a different you know requirements. And then the final, uh, I believe, uh, is that uh, we should look at the uh, uh, ch examine the currently proposed indices and see how they, how well they, um, maybe go back to TVOC, or maybe, I don't know, I mean, go to a, a certain pragmatic solutions, some, something in between, maybe, and find out how they uh, actually perform. So this, I believe, this is the future agenda for, uh, that is needed to develop the IQ metric. I stop here. It was a little bit more than half an hour, but I hope uh, that uh, you enjoyed my presentation, and I'll be looking forward now to address the questions and comments. If you have further questions or comments, you can always send me an email. And my email address is indicated in the bottom of this slide. So um, thank you very much for the, uh, your attention.